Ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Optimize Your Body podcast. As always, we've got another incredible guest here today, and she goes by the name of Sarah King. In fact, just found out she literally lives like 15 minutes away from me, and we're here on Zoom doing an interview. How's it going, my friend? <laughs> it is good. I know we're literally neighbors, <laughs> but you know, you could be an ocean away because we're we're doing this on Zoom today, even though we could have done it in person. But I'm excited to have this chat. Likewise, likewise. Really, really excited to have you on. And I think this is going to be really, really beneficial for just my audience in general but especially for my female audience, because what I've, it's not out of choice. I just find that, you know, I, I would say probably 90% of my guests are male. So I am actively trying to get more females on, uh, experts like yourself, but also to get that different perspective as well. So if you wouldn't mind telling the audience a bit more about yourself. Yeah. So obviously my name is Sarah. Um, I'm on pretty much like every social media platform under the name Sarah Liz King. Uh, and I'm an exercise physiologist by trade and also a health and recovery coach. I specifically work with women who are seeking to find food freedom, have a be better relationship with exercise, improve their body image. And more specifically, I do work with women's health conditions. The one that I most frequently see is something called hypothalamic amenorrhea, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit. So I do help people recover their periods and get pregnant as well. So that's a little bit about uh, what I do. And in terms of my background, I'm American originally. Australia is now home, has been for over 20 years. And I live in beautiful Bondi Beach with my dog, Henry, who you might hear, hopefully not too often, bark in the background <laughs> at times. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'd love to tap deeper into this right now. First and foremost, there's so much there. I want to, I had like five questions come into my mind then I got to stay on track here. No, but you were saying then about helping women get pregnant as well. And I actually talked to a, had a fertility expert on yesterday, actually. And I'd love to get your insight on this as well. This is that you can tell this is a bit of a personal thing here as well, right? Because um, my girlfriend and I do want to have kids one day. So I'm really interested in this, but it is basically an epidemic right now, right? In terms of fertility issues. And I'd love to know what you think. I know it's multifactorial, but what you think the biggest kind of factors are, and then to stack this question up and challenge you even more, um, what kind of solutions you find uh or the big rocks that you find really help people move the needle forward with the fertility stuff, females? Yeah. So, I mean, fertility is so complex and there are so many layers to it. And to be honest, we don't really know what our fertility is like until we walk down the road of potentially wanting to try and have children. And it's a two-way street. When we think about fertility, it's both male and female fertility factors that can then lead to a healthy pregnancy. If we're thinking about women's fertility, there are many, many things that can contribute to fertility issues. I guess what I see predominantly is people that kind of sit on potentially both sides of the spectrum when it comes to lifestyle choices and how those can influence our fertility. So for example, not being able to prioritize exercise because maybe you've been avoiding exercise because maybe you've had past problematic, harmful experiences with it and your relationship with food isn't that great can then lead you to have, I guess, a, a lifestyle that doesn't really help support overall fertility and the health of your ovaries and your eggs. On the flip side of things, there are also people that can take things too far in terms of their lifestyle, thinking that they're being the healthiest version of themselves, but to the point where, you know, maybe even unintentionally, they might not be meeting their energy requirements. They might be pushing really, really hard in the gym or with whatever kinds of workouts or exercise they're doing they might be living a very stressful lifestyle and again that can create a, like a suboptimal environment for your fertility and I often see that because I'm working with very uh, high achievers people who 
you know, have always been told that this is the quote unquote healthiest thing to do. But then as a result of that, their fertility is suboptimal normally because either they have menstrual irregularities, so very irregular cycles, or their menstrual cycle has completely gone missing. And that is due to something called hypothalamic amenorrhea most of the time, if they have had previously quite healthy cycles before. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. And in terms of the cycle and just health in general, you just touched on food freedom. I'm going to shift gears real quick here, <laughs> going into fertility and straight out again, because that's a whole podcast within itself, right? So maybe we could do a separate one on that. But you mentioned food freedom. How would you define that to the audience? And because what I love about you is everything you talk about is like sustainable. Got to make things sustainable. I love that. How would you describe that to the audience? And again, what kind of things would you say help people create that, even though I know there's so much variance, you know, from person to person? Yeah. And I think everyone's definition of food freedom is going to be a little bit different. So for me, when I think about food freedom, I define it as being able to build trust around food, know that all foods can fit, being able to tune in and listen to your body and actually understand its cues and what those mean in terms of nourishing your body. And most of all, even though it is full permission to eat all foods, it's actually thinking about this concept of balance over time, which I think is something that uh, a lot of people get caught up on because if they think about, oh, if I give myself permission to eat, then I'm just going to eat X, Y, and Z forever. I'm just going to eat ice cream forever. I'm just going to eat donuts forever. I'm not going to want nutritious foods. But the components of body respect and balance over time, I think, is what we need to kind of still emphasize when we're talking about food freedom, because it is part of those principles of making sure that we feel good in our choices. And that's such a nuanced thing, right? I think when we think about the flip side of things, which is diet culture, there's a very much black and white approach. It tells you that you can eat this and you can't eat that. And that as long as you follow this specific, specific set of, you know, rules or routines or types of foods or ways of eating, then you'll be doing the quote unquote right thing. But with food freedom, it's actually about learning what is right for you, which is this gray zone in between that takes a lot of trial and error, which is why it's really important to have support while you're going through that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously you do help people with individuals with eating disorders, right? Yes. What would you say are the most common eating disorders that you deal with? And, you know, any other information you've got on that in terms of all the people you've helped with these issues? Yeah. So I see a wide variety of people that have both just disordered eating and clinically diagnosed eating disorders. Now, if we actually look at the statistics, the most commonly um, diagnosed eating disorder is binge eating disorder. It kind of outweighs all of the rest of them. Um, but it's still not really talked about enough. So for the individuals that I see, I predominantly see people that have restrictive eating tendencies. So that could fall into, you know, binge eating, bulimia uh, and anorexia, because sometimes, you know, why those uh, disordered eating patterns are happening is because we're not allowing ourselves certain things as an element of restriction. Um, but predominantly, I would say that the people that I see are more on that like orthorexic side of things. So like very overly focused on that healthy eating. Now, orthorexia is not something that we have in the DSM-5. It's not something that is seen as a quote unquote clinical diagnosis, but I definitely see it really, really, really often. And then people that have had a history of anorexia or bulimia. So those are the, the main kinds of populations I see. And I've also seen people that have never been clinically diagnosed with an eating disorder, but know that they struggle with their relationship with food. And what I always say to people is that it's not really the definition that matters. What matters is if you're aware that your relationship with food is impacting your life and you know that working on that relationship with food would improve your life, that's all the information that you need to go seek help, treatment and support. Mm, And I talk about this all the time, Sarah, right? But I used to struggle, long story short, with 
I labeled it. I just had a thought then when you were saying that I kind of labeled it binge eating, but I'm like, looking back, was that emotional eating or binge eating? Not sure. Uh, in my bodybuilding days, probably a combination of both. How would you distinguish the difference between, you know, just emotional eating, which to be honest, most people do based on my experience. A lot of people, they're not really in tune with true hunger for the most part. A lot of the times they eat based on emotions a lot of the time, but how would you distinguish the difference between the two? Yeah. So I'm going to answer this question in a few parts. The first is kind of how we define binge eating. So there are, there's both objective binge eating and there is subjective binge eating. And you can have episodes of binge eating without having binge eating disorder. So there's a few kind of things to keep in mind there. So objective binge eating is kind of what we classify as this like, what would be the clinical diagnosis that we look at? So it's basically an objectively large amount of food eaten at a swift pace in a short period of time. So you can think about like a supermarket trolley's worth of food in a span of a few hours, that kind of thing. There is also, and it causes, you know, the key thing is that it causes um, distress to the person involved, both physical, psychological, emotional distress to the person. So there's a huge impact on their life. Secondly, we have got subjective binge eating, which means that the amount of food eaten might not be objectively that large. However, to the person, it feels like too much food and it causes that same distress that we talked about before. So psychological distress, physical distress, social, emotional distress, and the person feels quote unquote out of control, right? Both of those things can ring true for people. It doesn't actually matter what the amount of food is. It's actually the experience of eating the food and what it means for that person that can really, I guess, give us insight into how they might be struggling with food. Now, if we pull that apart, binge eating or binge episodes of binges can happen for a variety of reasons, right? It can happen because we physically restrict food. That's probably the number one reason. Um, it could also happen if we mentally restrict food. So if we're like, oh, I eat enough food, but I don't give myself permission to eat certain foods, then those foods can sometimes become triggers. It can be for environmental reasons. So we see a particular thing and then it kind of spurs us in some way to eat that thing. And it can also be emotional. Now, when we think of emotional eating, we automatically think of it as a really bad thing. But we eat for emotional reasons all the time. Right? We eat when we're happy or we're celebrating. We can also eat when we're stressed or when we're sad. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. The only time that it becomes problematic is if you feel it's your, you know, your only way to cope. If it's the, the coping strategy you go to all of the time to handle your issues or the stress of the day or feeling really sad or alone. And that's when we kind of have to go, okay, if that's a problem for you and you feel like you need better ways to cope, then we probably need to work on your emotional regulation strategies. And at the same time, we probably need to make sure that there are no other triggers in the mix that might be causing these binges. For example, not meeting your energy requirements as one, not having rigid food rules, as another, um, looking at your environment as another. So it is something that sounds really, really simple, but there are a lot of factors that we have to kind of think about. But in and of itself, um, people, you know, eat larger amounts of foods than they'd like to at times, and that's okay. People emotionally eat sometimes, that's okay. But if you feel like it's this pattern that is causing you a lot of distress, then that's something to definitely get help and support with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I was just thinking then, yeah, okay, well, you could kind of label what I had as, for a period of time, binge eating, because it would cause me distress, of course. You know, when you're eating copious amounts of food in a small window, obviously it affects everything, the difference from your sleep to your gut, how you feel mentally the next day and everything else. So, because it's such a complex uh, topic, right? But in terms of what you've dealt with with clients, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of like common patterns that you might see with people 
with having a poor relationship with food, perhaps binge in too you know, frequently. And is there certain patterns that you picked up on is what I'm trying to say. And is there any way, oh, this is such a broad question, so it might be tough for you to answer. Just like, you know, interrupting those patterns. Is there any like a, a, maybe top three methods or any kind of methods that come to mind that you think really helps? I know environment's a big one. Yeah. So if we're talking about, I guess, commonalities that might be triggering people to, to binge or to overeat, one of the biggest ones is having really unrelenting high standards for how you feel like you should or you must eat. And this is an easy way to say that for a lot of people, that's dieting. That's like really rigid diets that tell us we can't have a certain thing or that we have to stick to a set number of calories a day that might be way, way, way too low for what our body needs. Um, it could be trying to, you know, do that while also sticking to a really regimented exercise routine that's making us feel incredibly fatigued. And that layer then adds on another effect, which, you know, we think about quote unquote willpower as being something that we absolutely need to make sure that we don't eat certain things. But actually what we're doing when we, you know, take all of these foods out, have this really strict approach um, is that it sets us up for failure a lot of the time. And this is because when you tell your brain you can't have X, Y or Z, that's all it wants to think about especially when you are in a caloric deficit and in a, a very significant caloric deficit, your brain doesn't like that because it wants to keep you alive. So it's going to make you focus on food. It's going to make you think about food. And this mental hunger can often be the starting point for when we start to physically eat, then making us kind of eat maybe too quickly or an amount of food that feels like too much at that time for us, or it makes me, us feel physically uncomfortable or it leads to a binge. So that's one thing. I definitely find really, really strict approaches with food, really, really significant caloric deficits, whether that is just through the way that you're eating or created through really high uh, energy output. So, so a lot of times, like for example, athletes that I work with, or people that are just recreationally really active aren't aware of how much energy their body truly needs. And then they get really, really frustrated with why these, you know, binge or overeating episodes are happening to them. And of course, the solution isn't the solution that most people want because it's not a quick fix. It's kind of going, cool, well, the step, the first step is to make sure that your energy intake is the right energy intake for you, right? And you need to work with a health professional to make sure that you, I guess, meet those energy requirements. But it's not just about the energy. So it's a making sure that you're having all the different kinds of macronutrients. I know that, for example, low carb and keto is all the rage right now. But, you know, if you're cutting out those carbohydrates significantly, our brain is the only thing that runs purely on glucose. So we're going to have extreme cravings and, and energy crashes if we're not making sure that we have sustainable carbohydrates and, and glucose sources to keep us, us going. And then also once we meet, met all of our energy requirements, it's also making sure that whatever exercise we're doing, that even if we have particular goals we want to reach, we're being very realistic about the timeline I, and this is where I see a lot of problems with like, I guess, like those challenges that are set for like really short time periods, which can cause people to work really, really, really hard. But then they get to the end and they go, well, how do we keep going after this? And so it's about kind of going, yeah. okay, I don't want to have huge energy outputs if my energy inputs, obviously not great because then that can cause that, I guess, overeating, binge eating to happen because your body's simply trying to get the energy that it needs. Um, so making sure that we have a balanced approach to exercise. And the third would be just looking at, I guess, your belief systems around food, your food rules, your food fears, all of those kinds of things, and being able to talk through it with someone so that you can see that for the most part, 
um, you can meet all of your goals without needing to cut out any food groups, without needing to avoid certain things. Because when you get to the age of 80, you're not going to be like, oh, I'm so glad I avoided birthday cake at every single occasion. You're going to want to be like, I'm so glad I figured out a way of feeling balanced and enjoying my life and all of these things that life has to offer. And food is one of them. It's so interesting what you said there about willpower as well, right? You probably get this all the time in terms of people just think they can rely on willpower and saying no, and then they beat themselves up then when they might, you know, let themselves go a little bit. And it's just a vicious cycle. It's like a muscle, right? It just gets tired. You can't rely on that willpower forever. You have to change those those fundamental behaviors. I'd love to ask you about the, you know, we, t- we talked about commonalities, but like in terms of the biggest challenges you get, because exactly what you said then, people come to people like us and they're looking for the answer and they want it now. Yesterday, they wanted it, right? <laughs> I want the answer. How do I do this? And it takes so much patience and certain people have been living a certain way or they've had certain behaviors around food for years and years and it just doesn't happen overnight, right? So curious to know what the biggest kind of challenges are that come to mind that you face with clients in terms of whether that be like patience or whether that be, you know, telling them to maybe eat a bit more, add some of these foods in instead of taking away. Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge is this like huge fear of weight gain because there's this association that if you allow yourself to eat these foods, and allow yourself to eat an adequate amount, that the automatic thing that's going to happen immediately is that you're going to put on so much weight. And I think our our culture is incredibly fat phobic and, and diet culture sells us this belief that, you know, if you eat a certain way and you train a certain way, then you'll look a certain way. And if you don't, then you're lazy and you should be ashamed of yourself. So there's so much wrapped up And there's so much fear involved, even though people want this freedom, they want the peace, they want the relationship with food, they want, you know, to be able to navigate life with all of these better skills, but there's a huge fear that they have to get over first. And that's often the fear of weight gain. And it isn't so much about like the extra number on the scale. It's about what that weight means about them as a person or what they believe it means about them as a person, how they judge themselves if their body changes. And working through that is absolutely critical to success, I find. And it is one of the most challenging aspects of this process. Um, Navigating those fears, navigating body image. People think like, oh, my body image is fine. And then they start this process and they're actually like, okay, body image is something we're going to talk about pretty much every session. It's definitely something that we talk about with clients a whole lot because I think the other unrealistic expectation is that what we see on social media is like, oh, if you have like food freedom and you know, if you have a good relationship with food, then you like automatically love your body and your life is so much easier. And it just sets up like a, another set of completely unrealistic expectations because this work is hard. This work is emotional. This work is unlearning a whole bunch of patterns and habits, like you said, that we've had for years. It's challenging assumptions that you might have heard from your culture or picked up from your own experiences. And that willingness to not only change your habits, but also allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to work on some of the emotional aspects of your well-being is the biggest obstacle, but also the most transformative process because then you're able to get to a place where you can feel a little bit more at peace And while you might not go from, I guess, complete uh, like negativity towards your body to complete positivity, you'll probably get to a place where you can feel a huge amount of acceptance and and respect and care for your body, which is always the, the goal that I tell people, because that's really what we want to be focusing on for your entire life is how can we take care of 
ourselves and what does that look like and how does that change depending on whatever life stage we're in. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Body image. Let's touch on that, Sarah, right? So it's all about that awareness. It's like what you said then. The first step is being aware. Like you say, people come on the journey with you or me, for example, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, my body image is cool. Everything's cool. But then they you shine a light on certain things and they're like, oh, actually. <laughs> so what is it that comes to mind for you when you think of maybe a negative body image or some of those issues that you face with clients? So it, for anyone listening, I guess we can talk about what are some indications that you might be struggling with your body image. So some of the things that come to mind are comparison. So comparing yourself with either maybe a past version of yourself that you always thought was better somehow or comparing yourself to others. And when we talk about comparison, there's either upwards comparison or downwards comparison. So upwards comparison is uh, other person so much better than me. Downwards comparison is I'm so much better than the other person. And we know it's that upwards comparison that is really associated with negative body image. Comparison is definitely one. Second one would be body checking. So spending a lot of time looking at yourself in the mirror or like pinching certain areas of your body, self-weighing or, you know, hopping on the scale an excessive number of times can be a, a form of body checking. It doesn't actually have to be that often, but it's even the like thought of, oh my God, if the scales aren't available to me, I feel like I might freak out. Um, so that's another really common sign. The next one is actually body avoidance. So you can be high on body checking and also high on body avoidance. If you're struggling with your body image, body avoidance is exactly what you think it is. So trying to hide yourself, whether that's in clothes or staying away from social situations, staying away from like any reflective surface to the point that it impedes your life. So not wanting to look at yourself in the mirror at all feeling like you need to shower in the dark, all of those kinds of things can be complete body avoidance. And then really negative self-talk is a really common one as well. So noticing that you're really hypercritical towards your body um, and that that is a more, I guess, frequent voice that you hear compared to any more positive voices or more neutral voices. So those are some of, some of the most common things that come up for the clients that we see and the journey towards, I guess, overcoming them. Like you said, number one is first awareness. And then number two is looking at, okay, well, how do we find that middle ground? Which is why I always talk about the concept of body neutrality, because I think for a lot of people, if you're struggling with negative body image to go, okay, well, the solution to this is feeling like you have to have endless self-love, it's usually a step too far. Often the first step is kind of accepting you might not like your body right now. And actually that's okay, but you need to learn how to still respect it and take care of it while we work on your brain coming to terms with your body being the way that it is at this moment without being hugely critical about it. Because even though diet culture sells us this idea that if you are in a smaller body, then your life will be perfect and you'll never have any problems. It's actually not the case at all. And what I try and teach people is that you don't have to love yourself endlessly in order to live a fulfilling, meaningful life. And you can look after your health at any size of your body but you have to get comfortable first with the idea that maybe you won't love it immediately and that that's a better place where we can start working on health behaviors from, I guess, a more neutral place. Yeah, that's uh, so powerful. And all those things, there's so many things you're saying which are resonating. And it's so great to have like an expert on who coaches people through this as well, because that gives you so much kind of wisdom in terms of, there's a lot of commonalities, right? But what you said then about negative self-talk, okay, comparisons, actually, I definitely want to touch on this. This is a massive uh, struggle that I still have with some clients and stuff, right? And there's a few things. Obviously, you've got social media, like you said, right? You, you know, your emotional environment or whatever you want to call it. Because is it true that most of the uh, comparisons that we do are done like subconsciously as well? I think I read like a lot of them are done subconsciously without us being fully aware. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I guess a lot of our unconscious thinking only becomes conscious when we start to question it. Mm. Like you might get a flicker of awareness at some moment, but then it's when you dig deeper and you, you are kind of asked like, you know, when was the first time you think this, this might've happened for you? And then people kind of have to go, oh, this has been happening for a while. Mm. That gives you a really big clue into it. Yeah. And then it comes down to literally unlearning all those stories you've told yourself right over the years. Yeah. But something you said that really stood out, especially with female clients, is when they look back at old pictures of themselves. And this goes two ways. They look back, they're always comparing themselves to a point where, you know, I had one client where she was like, you know, she ended up getting like adrenal fatigue and everything else. She was doing like um, loads of CrossFit. Then she gave birth and stuff like that. So she had lots of stuff going on. Um, but because she was like kind of so lean, leaning up to that, she was always comparing herself to that lean, unhealthy version of herself, essentially, right? Because she ended up with adrenal fatigue and everything else and she was overtraining. But because she was lean, she's constantly comparing herself to that. And obviously it was a struggle to get her out of that, but she made tremendous progress. Um, but the other thing I get then is sometimes people look back and they go, oh, wow, I didn't actually realize then, I didn't appreciate that I was actually in, you know, I was looking good. But even then, they had the same image of their body, if that makes sense. So even though they, you know, they might have been 20 kilos lighter, let's say, they still at the thought that of their body, they still had negative self-talk and stuff like that, right? So yeah, sorry, I was just waffling a bit there, but the negative self-talk um, and the comparisons, how do you kind of like deal with that kind of stuff? I know, because it's, 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 it's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> let's be honest, to get yeah. people to overcome that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're really right in what you said when we talk about body image. Our perception can be very different from our reality we can have a very warped perception of our body and when we're talking about body image there's that perceptual body image right how we think we see our body whether or not that's our reality like our reality matches our perception or it's buried does our effective body image affective so what how we feel about our body is our cognitive body image how we think about our body and then as our behavioral body body image so what we do because of the way we think about our body image. So there's lots of different domains to kind of uh, think about, but obviously the cognitive aspect, so what we think about our body image is the one that most people get stuck on because we can have these like uh, negative thought spirals that happen that tell us all of these different things. And how do we actually change that really ingrained negative self-talk? And it's really tough and it takes a really, really long time because it's often that we might have this negative talk, uh, self-talk in other aspects of our lives as well. So it could be a really strong unlearning, relearning process. But the first one is to just have, you know, just go to, I guess, a day where you're really, really struggling with your body image. Just say like it's a bad body image day. So to anyone listening that might be having a bad body image day, just want you to get like a piece of paper out and you don't have to keep this piece of paper. It doesn't need to be in your journal. It could just be a random notebook. And I just want you to write down all of the different thoughts that come to mind. You're not going to be judgmental about what they are. You're just going to be curious, like a bit of a scientist. You're just going to write down all of the negative thoughts that you might be having. Because at, at the first instance, what this does is it helps you get space from them. When they're swirling around in your head, it's very, very hard to do this. So you've written them all down and then you can kind of go, oh, this is really interesting. What is the story I'm telling myself here? Right? So the story I might be telling myself is I can only be happy if I'm leaner or I am so, I guess, disgusting or blah, 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 because I've quote unquote, let myself get this way. So whatever story you're telling yourself there. Now, what you're doing isn't trying to go, okay, well, now I'm going to change this story immediately. It is to kind of say, is this serving you? Is this negative self-talk actually helping you take better care of yourself? Is it actually helping you to feel good enough to move towards taking the time to move your body, taking the time 
to get enough rest, taking the time to do self-care, taking all of those things that we need to to actually help support our health. And for most people, it doesn't. It just makes them feel worse about themselves. And they might be um, motivated by fear or these like harmful feelings for like a hot second, but it's it's actually not sustainably making them I guess, feel good about those health behaviors coming a part of their routine or their habit. So then we do is like when this starts to happen, when we notice this story, we can kind of call it out. Oh, this is the not good enough story. This is like the story I've told myself time and time again, right? And when we meet that story with compassion, that's when we can start to actually really change our habits and the way that we speak to ourselves. And that is the antidote that we really, really need. And that is a really tough antidote because speaking to yourself from a place of kindness and compassion can feel really foreign and almost like inauthentic when you're used to a really harmful voice. So it can take a while to just get used to, oh, this is my healthy self. This is what it sounds like if I were to speak to a friend. This is what it sounds like if I was speaking to the eight-year-old version of me. And this is how I would move myself through that situation if that's how I was seeing it or speaking to myself. So I really urge anyone to try that kind of exercise out. Obviously, it's one of many, but it can be very powerful. The thing is, that to be consistent with it, it is often kind of you need someone to kind of mirror these things back to you, which is why working with someone like myself or yourself can be so helpful in this process. Yeah, I love it. Really, really insightful. And I think it's helpful for women, but also also men as well. Let's be honest, right? Because mm. again, I'm not going to waffle on about my story, but with the bodybuilding days, I used to struggle with body image. Even when I was in great shape, I was obviously comparing myself again, right? Yeah. To some of the best physiques on the planet. So when you're driven so much by that, whether it's losing weight or looking good physically, it kind of always ends up disappointing. Like you've, you've got to focus on the other stuff, right? Which is the stuff we're talking about health. I'd love to know your take on the body positivity movement in terms of, you know, like love yourself regardless and everything else, which... You know, I, I just love to know your 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 kind of view on that. So the body positivity movement is really not meant for people like me. It's not it's not a straight sized person movement. It is meant as a, a kind of a movement for people in marginalized environments to be seen and to show that acceptance can happen in those marginalized societies but body positivity has kind of been misconstrued a lot as I have to love myself and if I have you know normal rolls of skin when I sit down and crawl forward or if I show my cellulite then that is body positivity so I really encourage people to get curious about body positivity but for the fundamental reasons why it started in the first place which was as a a kind of fat positive movement, a movement for black women, a movement for disabled people um, to feel okay and comfortable and to show the world that these bodies exist and that there is no shame in existing in that, in that size and and navigating through the world um, in your here and now body, whatever that may be. But I personally think it's really, really difficult to be overly focused on, I think, you know, this like element of self-love, right? Mostly because I think that the goal in life shouldn't be to spend excessive amounts of time thinking about your body or whether or not you love it or you hate it. It should be to get to a place where you can care for your body. You can do the things necessary to make sure that you are, you know, taking care of your own well-being. But that actually the whole point of this is to get to a place where you have more mental and more mental space in your brain, more physical energy in your day to just build a life that feels good. And I think, you know, for me, that sits in the more like body neutrality side of things, because I don't want people to spend endless hours 
striving towards consistent self-love. I just want to go, you know what? You can care and respect your body as it is right now and look after it. That's actually good enough. And then you'll have so much more energy to go pursue all the other things in life that are really amazing, incredible and fulfilling. So that's that's my my own personal take on it. Yeah, I love that. And like with obesity, for example, would you say, because everyone's equal, right? On a human level, everyone is equal, right? There's, I don't care, color skin, weight, so everyone's equal, the humans, right? But at the same time, when it's um, like obesity and stuff, and look, I've got a lot of compassion because the bottom line is, you know, it's it's really, really challenging for someone who's overweight, let alone obese, to be able to start that journey uh, and move in the other direction. It's extremely tough, to say the least. But would you, because my take is like, I, I think at the same time, it kind of gives people, some people maybe a little bit of an excuse when they see, you know, like obesity being promoted almost to uh, almost have an excuse to not kind of take action then to say, it's okay, I can love my body. But the reality is when it comes to health and longevity, you know, uh, you do need to take care of yourself, right? That's kind of like my take on it anyway, you know? Yeah. And look, I think what we often do is we make assumptions that maybe we 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 don't question when mm. we're looking at people who might be living in, in larger bodies and i think it's really really important to question what assumptions we might hold in that respect because you know we know that weight is influenced by so many different factors genetics being one environment being the other like go on you know hundreds of different things but a lot of people assume that if you live in a larger size body that you just don't care about your health and I think that's incredibly untrue for a lot of people. Um, and I, I think, you know, I guess I come from the standpoint of, you know, health at every size, which just means that there's a huge focus on health behaviors being important and removing weight stigma okay. as the basis of kind of helping people adopt habits that are going to serve their own health and their own well-being it doesn't demonize weight loss, which I think is really great, but it also doesn't promote it as the solution. It kind of goes, we know that it, irregardless of whether your body size changes, that these actual habits will improve your health exponentially. Awesome. And cellulite, right? You mentioned this quickly. I do want to ask you about this because I think my female audience will kill me if I don't at least ask you about this. But yeah, with cellulite, right? I mean, it's uh, a lot of women they struggle with that, right? And they struggle with the, the body image thing of that as well. You know, full transparency, even my, hopefully she won't mind me saying this is too late now. Now nah, she'd be fine. My girlfriend, you know, she's like really lean, healthy, fit, everything else. Um, but even she, you know, um, I don't notice it at all. Full transparency, I've never noticed it, but she does because she mentioned it and stuff. And she's like, oh, how do I? I'm like, I really can't notice it genuinely, right? And bottom line is, you know, you need to be kind of to yourself, right? <laughs> um, but it is a common thing that I, I, I get asked by female clients and stuff like that. Like, how do I get rid of cellulite and everything else? Um, but I'd love to know your take on it. Firstly, you know, going back to what you said, body appreciation and body acceptance and switching your mindset around this is key. Cause if you're searching for areas on your body that you don't like, like I said earlier, we're always going to be searching for that. Right. But yeah, what's your, your take on there? If there's any kind of like, if you've had those struggles with clients and what kind of advice you give them or with your own experience, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I think, um, so cellulite, if we kind of look at it is more common in females because of the structure of the way our cells are. Uh, so uh, it's basically on a physiological level, just your fat cells kind of pushing through the structure. And men tend to have like a more tightly knit structure that makes sure that those fat cells don't push through as often. But it still happens to people of both genders. Um, I think it can be really hard because there's this expectation that we should be quote unquote flawless, which, you know, I don't, I think it's unrealistic. I think for women who might be struggling, yes, you can't, I mean, you can't really spot reduce anything, but I think acknowledging that, you know, you want things to be different is completely valid. But at the same time, kind of going is putting in exponential effort to transform my body actually going to be worth the outcome of this thing changing? 
if I'm changing 95% of my life to get some kind of like one or 2% change, is that actually how you want to be spending your time? And for most people, when you kind of lay it out, if unless it's like a really significant, I guess, um, uh, something they're very self-conscious about, a lot of time people are like, you know what, me living my general healthy life is kind of enough and shifting the focus. I think we really have to be as, as hard as this is, like kind to ourselves and realize like bodies change and bodies aren't perfect and that's what kind of makes them perfect. And if we can look, look at ourselves as a whole person instead of a collection of body parts, we can actually start to move past a lot of these um, insecurities that we hold. And just to shift gears into exercise, right? Because I know you've dealt with a lot of people, Sarah, who struggle with exercise addiction. And I know you help them kind of implement exercise habits that they can sustain and which are also going to support the issues they've had with their eating disorder. What are the kind of fundamentals that you, I know it depends on the person always, but the fundamentals that you kind of talk about when it comes to exercise um, relating to people with a poor relationship with food? Oh, this is such a big... Yeah, I know. As, as I was asking it, I'm like, yeah, you can't answer that. It's just too many, there's too many variables. So, okay, with exercise, is there anything that comes to mind which you think like is maybe the should be the cornerstone, you know, for most people? If, if I think we should detach it from the eating disorder stuff because that's going to be so specific. But just because you're an exercise physiologist, what are the kind of big rocks that you look at with exercise, if there's any? So, I mean, as an exercise physiologist, I'm someone that's always looking at exercise like in a very positive light. There's so many benefits that we can get from it. It's a privilege to be able to like and enjoy exercise. I don't think everyone does and that's okay. But I think fundamentally we know that because it is kind of dose responsive, right? So to get these benefits, we have to be doing some consistently over our lifespan that the most important factor is enjoyment, right? So finding something that we can, even if we don't love it, at least we don't despise it. Um, but I think for women in particular, I'm, I'm harping on all the time about the importance of strength training. So I'm like, find something that you enjoy and then make sure you strength train at least twice a week <laughs> because our bone health is so important. And then on the flip side of things, if you overdo things, you can definitely have too much of a good thing and the benefits that you actually gain start to be lost. So when you think about overtraining or over extending yourself, you can really run into some problems where, you know, at first your bone health is improved by lots of strength training, but if you overtrain to the point of, for example, losing your menstrual cycle or being caught in this relative energy deficiency, then your bone health might actually start to deteriorate a little bit. And instead of improving your strength, your strength either stagnates or starts to decrease a little bit. So when it comes to, I guess, people that might be struggling with exercise addiction or things that might be driving exercise addiction, like muscle dys dysmorphia um, or the addiction to the uh, like mood boosting benefits that they get, then we really have to slowly work on bringing people back down to a more sustainable level over time. And I guess what makes, I guess how we know exercise is addictive is these two main properties, which is tolerance and withdrawal, which is kind of what we see if we talk about other substances like alcohol. So tolerance is I need a certain amount of exercise to make me feel euphoric. But then over time, I need more and more and more to make me feel that same level of euphoric or accomplished or achieved or whatever it might be. And then when I don't get that amount, I experience elements of withdrawal, right? And that can be really tricky because when we're changing people's exercise routines to bring it back into balance, we also have to deal with, okay, well, how are we going to cope with those elements of withdrawal that happen? And that can often be mood being really, really flat feeling like you are really irritable. Uh, it can often actually mean people feel more fatigued because when they're exercising, their body's running on high levels of cortisol. 
uh, and it's a really tricky fine balance to get people back down to a good level of exercise that's maintainable, that's that's good for their health. Um, but those are the kinds of things I'm I'm thinking about in terms of like promoting exercise overall is a really, really positive thing, but making sure that it is a sustainable amount and and match to your goals and your your health and your well-being. See, there's so much to it, right? And I think this is amazing for the audience because I always talk about this similar sort of stuff. It's like the answer is the ideal answer to most questions is like it depends, right? It depends yeah. on the person. But it's like when you're speaking to a broad audience, it's tricky sometimes. But what you were saying then, the word that comes to mind is appropriate. Like I always talk about to people, it's like you've got to be doing the appropriate amount for you, right? So optimal is not always going to be like what you see on paper or whatever. It's not going to be optimal for you unless it's appropriate those of stress and all the other factors that come into it. Strength training though, I'm glad you touched on that for bone health and obviously just for longevity, you know, strength is really, really important as well. So that is almost from what you're saying then, like the cornerstone mainly for most of your clients is to do like strength training a couple of times a week. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, we have our own online training program specifically for people that might have come from a past of disordered eating or I guess having like difficult relationships with exercise um, because we want people to go, you know, even if it was that way in the past, it doesn't have to be that way in the future and you can get support and you get guidance. You can actually learn, like you said, what's the appropriate amount for you? Because I think people are often very, very surprised that they can get incredible results, incredible outcomes from actually doing really a lot less than they expected. But when it's well-programmed and when they understand the principles and what to do, they actually go, oh, this is like so much easier and so much more enjoyable than it ever has been. So I think that's really the, the beauty of teaching people about the appropriateness of what is enough or the right amount for them. Yeah. And you mentioned type A personalities. A lot of my clients are type A's and the same thing happens. A lot of them come to me and they're like doing way more than they need to. And funny enough, their body wasn't responding. They weren't feeling great doing what they were doing. And then when we scale it back a bit, but we add in that exactly what you're doing, we add in that smart piece, everything kind of changes, right? Um, for the most part, I'd love to kind of wrap this up with your experience, my friend, in terms of have you dealt with any of these issues yourself, you know, being a female in terms of body image, uh, relationship with food, exercise or any of that stuff? Yeah. Um, ending on a, uh, a very potentially long answer, but I have dealt with a lot of these issues myself. Like you I actually came from a background of doing uh, bodybuilding competitions, which was a slippery slope into developing a full-blown eating disorder, which at the time I was very much in denial about, but was very much the case. So I did uh, like the fitness modeling category in, in a few bodybuilding competitions. And there was one where I was about to enter and I was like, you know what? I'm actually really unwell. Like I knew I was really unwell, but it was the community that was like, oh my God, you look so great. Like, why aren't you up on stage? And I was like, I can now see how easy it is to fall into problematic patterns. Uh, getting myself out of an eating disorder was a lot harder and took a lot more time than it did to fall into one. So I was in and out of different kinds of treatments for years. And it finally just got to the point where, you know, I had a friend come visit and she was like, if you don't do something about this, this is going to be your whole life. And as hard as it was at that point, I was like, oh God, okay, something really has to change here. Um, and I remember going back to my doctor and her saying, well, maybe we need to try something that's a little bit more drastic to, to get things moving in the right direction. Uh, and so I ended up doing an intensive outpatient program um, at hospital, uh, many, many days per week where I was sat in a room with no windows uh, doing therapy, feeling my feelings, learning how to eat and re-nourish my body. And I can honestly say it was not enjoyable, but it was the most important thing that I ever did for myself. Um, and then once I had, you know, 
recovered from my eating disorder, there was one thing that kind of lingered, which is like I had a missing period for years. And my doctors had said, oh, you have PCOS and you can go on the pill and don't worry about it. But I always knew in the back of my mind that this wasn't normal and this wasn't okay. Um, and eventually came to figure out it was this condition called hypothalamic amenorrhea. Now, if anyone's interested about it, my podcast is pretty much dedicated to uh, both my story um, in previous episodes, but also how to recover from it. So yeah, the second part of my healing journey was learning that I needed to and could recover my recover my period naturally. Uh, and throughout that whole process, I really had to keep working on my relationship with food, my relationship with my body, and also my relationship with exercise has been quite a journey in terms of both needing to take breaks for reasons related to my eating disorder, uh, dealing with chronic pain, like a whole bunch of kind of other stuff. So uh, it's definitely made me a better health professional having had personal experience with <laughs> a lot of these problems myself. Yeah, I was just thinking then, I don't know how I skipped your story at the start, but that's all right. Reverse order. That's all good. We'll finish off, finish off with who Sarah is. That was the new new approach to a podcast. But um, yeah, just, I mean, there's so many, I could literally talk to you forever, right? Maybe we'll have to do another one one day um, and I can delve deeper into the, into those things. I wanted to talk about the thing that I can't even pronounce, the hypothalamus. Hypothalamic amenorrhea. It's a lot, but you can just say, hey, Jay. Yeah, that was something I wanted to touch on, but we didn't get there. But honestly, there's so much uh, wisdom and knowledge in this episode for the audience. So thank you very much for your time. And where can they find you, Sarah? So best place to find me is I'm most active on Instagram. So I'm on there at Sarah Liz King. My website's the same, sarahlizking.com, where you can check out my podcast, Holistic Health Radio, and all your favorite podcasting platforms. Awesome. I'll add all of this into the show notes. And thanks again for your time, my friend. That was uh, incredible. Thanks for having me.